You're listening to the Patient Advocacy Now podcast, presented by Greater National Advocates. It's just gut-wrenching sometimes. Like, if it's sad and they're crying, I might cry. (laughs) Amazing how many doctors do not even want to treat somebody who has Medicaid. Medical system is about making money. And I said, so are you hiring more nurses or you're just telling each nurse to work harder? Kathy Bond, thank you so much for being here. How are you? I am doing well, John, and thank you for having me. Thank you, Greater National, and especially a thanks to Brian. <laughs> we love Brad Schwartz. He's a, a great yep. figure. Um, I I want to kind of dive in and find out, you know, you've, you've been doing advocacy in some respect for 30 years. How did it start? So I got started. Actually, I say this. I am an accidental, on purpose, patient advocate. I got started accidentally. And I think being vulnerable is what made me be a patient advocate. Um, at the age of about 18 or so, My mom had a health scare, and it was very traumatic for her, but also for me. This is where I learned how to speak up for her, and in turn, for myself and for others. Um, I had a doctor that was wanted to do perform surgery, but I didn't understand why, and they couldn't give me a reason that satisfied me, or it could explain to me why she needed the surgery. They threw me out of the hospital room because I wouldn't consent, and just heartbroken and crying, I went to a desk and said, I need to speak to someone in charge. That was the only thing that I could think to say. And the lady at the um, information booth took mercy on me and called risk management. They came down and spoke with me and I explained the situation. I was crying. I was distraught, but I had enough um, knowledge and love for my mother to want to make sure that she got the best health care. And from there, it was off and running. But it was by accident that I became a patient advocate. And what made you feel compelled to do this for others? Obviously, we all feel the call when it's our own family, right? Some of us are a little bit less squeamish or have a little bit more of that let's do it attitude like you did, which is amazing. But what made you realize, you know what, I need to do this for other people? I think it's the, um, and I don't think I've said this out loud, but I think it's the tiger in me. It's the fight in me. I cannot stand seeing anyone being mistreated. I I, I absolutely detest it. Um, it annihilates people. It annihilates communities, societies. So anywhere I can, to, I can see to stand up for someone, I will. So what made me take this even beyond my family and friends is one day I was at the hospital with my mother and this lady needed help and she was being treated in a way that that was beneath to be treated humanly. And I went over and I said to her, can I help you? And I told her my name. And again, this is before I'm a board certified patient advocate. And she was just trying to get up and I said, let me help you. And I began to explain what she wanted and Relate to her what they said, what they explained it to her, actually. And from there, just the thanks that she gave me and the hug and just doing it whenever I seen someone needing my help, that made me become a patient advocate. And as you said in my bio, I'm a natural born teacher. I want to teach. I want to instruct. I want to make sure that if I know it, someone else can know it. What do you find that you teach the most to your clients? What, what's the gap in knowledge that you wish more people knew? Knowing their rights. Mm-hmm. When you know your rights and you know how to convey those rights, how to speak to them, how to communicate about it, you feel more empowered. And a no can quickly become a yes or I can't becomes I can. Or and even if it can't, you go away with the feeling that mm-hmm. you stood up for yourself and you knew what you could ask for. Whether we get it or not, we know what to ask for. So I teach people their rights. I teach them the how to stand up and advocate for those rights and just simple language and without being hostile or upset, but just simply knowing because it is empowering. But what's more empowering is know how to do it. I think that's such an important message, the idea that it's not just about knowing your rights, but also how to deliver 
the knowledge and kind of let people know that you know your rights so that it's not antagonistic. I mean, at the end of the day, if you're dealing with healthcare professionals, the last thing you want is for them to think that you're an enemy of some sort, that you're, you, you just want to listen. Look, I, I understand that I have this right. And there's a kindness and there's a way to articulate it that's effective so that you don't kind of, you know, have any animosity in the air. Absolutely. We've all encountered the, the well, I don't want to say all, but there are times I've encountered personally a nurse or a doctor, as I explained to you earlier, that was less than hospitable, that was truly unkind. And now that I've been doing this for a while, I know how to smile and just say what I need to say, but mean every word of it. I have, I think I have a nice smile. I try to be kind to everyone, but as I said earlier, there's a tiger in me and the tiger can smile, but I will <laughs> bite at the same time, but it's in a good manner in that I'm going to get what I need for myself, for my mother, for the person that I'm helping, whether it's for free or just if I'm being paid, it doesn't matter. We all deserve great health care. And if I'm around, you're going to get it. And what do you feel uh, is a good example? Can you give me an example of a patient right that you feel some patients don't know they have um, that you typically have to educate them on? Absolutely. Um, my next door neighbor is um, Vietnamese. Her husband had an accident at work. He sliced his hand really badly. And she called me while they're on the way to the hospital and asked if I could come on because they don't speak a lot of English, some, but not a lot. And so as I'm on my way, they're sitting in the waiting room and he's bleeding and no one is, is helping them. So when I get there, I asked and they signed in. She said yes. And I asked if they spoke to the one and she said no. There was, you know, there was no one to help them. And I said, what do you mean there's no one to help them? Well, no one understood what they were talking about. She didn't understand that she had the, the right to get an interpreter. So I go up with them and I say what we want. And they say, oh, well, you can you can uh, translate for them. And I said, no, I cannot. I do not speak Vietnamese. So we're going to get a Vietnamese interpreter. Well, it's going to take a couple of hours. I said, no, as you can see, he's bleeding. He doesn't have a couple of hours. You have 15 minutes to get someone on the phone and we would appreciate it. I stand right here and I move to the side so you can get someone else. But I will stand right here so that you won't forget us. And within 10 minutes, we had an interpreter on the phone. That's amazing. And just doing it politely and understanding that you can't block the line. I mean, those little touches really make a huge difference. Why do you feel that uh, people in the healthcare system don't uphold those patient rights more often? I think it's easy, it's easy. to not see people as human sometimes. When we see people on a daily basis, they're used to the cuts, they're used to the bruises, they're used to the emergencies. We're not. So it's easy to sometimes forget, not even um, on purpose, but to just push a person aside, especially when they have a situation where they are um, economically disadvantaged, um, can't speak the language very well. Um, sometimes being a uh, skin color this people may not think is appropriate or particular that they like. It's easy to dehumanize people. So I think just that smile is disarming, you know, but the words are knowledgeable. And those two things combined makes you, oh, wait a minute, let me get this right. Let me, oh, I'm sorry. And I've gotten that plenty of times. Oh, I'm sorry. Simply because I make that person human. I make that person seen and not be invisible or devalued. Yeah, absolutely. You touched on prejudice, you know, people seeing others as not human. And, and uh, I've read in your bio that, you know, you focus on minority cultures. Where do you see that happen? And, and how do you think we can kind of grow as a society to try and move uh, in a better direction in that front? On that front? Well, that, there are several things I think we can do. But one of the things that I feel if we start just in this one place, it can change our perception. If we actually take these two words off of the healthcare forms, black and white, that's a start. Because I say this all the time, I'm not a black woman, I'm a brown woman. My hair is black, 
but my skin is brown. Your shirt is white. Your skin is not. If we take those two words off of the forms, that's a beginning because that those words or African-American have stickiness to them. I'm an American. It doesn't mean I'm an African-American. I'm just an American. If we start just there, the visualization of those words and our history, it connects those two things. But we change that. It's connect that visualization. Yes, the history is still there, but it allows us, us to start off in a fresh way and go beyond that. That's one thing. The second thing I think would be just, we talk about sensitivity training and diversity training. Yes. Who's, who's teaching these classes? Are you including people that look like me? Are you including Asians and Hispanics and um, Vietnamese? Are you including Jamaicans? Are you including Africans? Because we're the ones that can tell you how we feel about a situation and can help make better decisions in the healthcare. And I think also nurses have a little bit more um, voice in the things that they can hear about with patients as well and not being rushed as well. Great ideas. I, I love the idea of making sure that the inclusivity of the instructors is, is equally if not more important than the idea of the training itself. Uh, to have an informed voice there. Um, when it comes to your role as an advocate and what kind of services you offer and what kind of help you actually give, it sounds like you're in the hospital setting with some clients. Um, what do you view your role? Because advocacy is kind of a weird umbrella term these days. Some people focus on billing. Some people are retired nurses and they really just are clinical advisors. You sound like you get your hands dirty in terms of uh, kind of navigating the system. What, what does it look like to work with you? Well, as you said, I'm not a clinician. I'm not a retired nurse or anything like that. And I don't do billing. To work with me is to just simply walk you in the hospital and show you and teach you or raise your expectations of what you're going to get, right? I can help you with communicating with the doctor. I can help you with understanding the diagnosis. I can even help with making sure that your medications will not have side effects or if you take several medications, getting, going to the pharmacy, having, these, um, having the medication is done, make sure everything is well with that, helping you know what the next steps will be if if you're diagnosed with a disease that you don't understand. In addition to that, I am at the hospital. I'm sitting there right with you. I will go to the appointments with you. I will even do a telehealth visit with you. I will be on the phone with you. Um, if you have family members that live out of town, I'm, the, I'm a good person that will relay what's going on to your family members if you give me the say-so or the permission to do so. Um, even if you're in the hospital, and I know this is... Um, kind of a, a situation for women where you have to get a mammogram. Having a male person that does that is very uncomfortable. So I can be somewhere close by with you to give you that assurance. So if you work with me, the one thing that you will get is assurance. Assurance that you'll be heard, protected, and cared for. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds like peace of mind to me, right? The assurance that you're going to be cared for is more than a lot. I think we've all had that that instance, myself included, where you're you check into the ER or urgent care. Four hours go by and you don't even know if they if they know you still exist. And it's very frustrating. A lot of people just don't know how to handle a situation like that. It is frustrating. Tell me about Tell me about your podcast uh, and, and what your goal was in creating the podcast. I think I was getting to think about that question. And I think my podcasting goals and my advocacy goals actually combine. They are separate, but they are combined. In my podcasting journey, I'm simply helping people to see beyond where they are. Whether it's a uh, healthcare situation, a loss of a loved one, financial situation, or just life. I'm making sure that I can encourage people, motivate, inspire them 
to see beyond that situation. One day doesn't, um, one day can change your life. And if you can see that, you can get to that life that you want. So whether I'm being a patient advocate or not on my podcast, I'm just a motivator. I'm a faith-based motivator because I use biblical technology, uh, terminology, biblical verses to inspire, to help, you know, to motivate and encourage. So my podcast is just about encouraging. Do you feel like faith and, and your kind of relationship with that part of your life um, informs the way you approach things? And is that why you've chose to kind of go down that journey in your podcast? Absolutely. Um, for me, my faith walk has been the, the defining factor. And even in me being a, a patient advocate, because one of the things that my faith teaches me is love. So when I say about Asians and Americans and uh, brown skin and, and white skin, it's, not, it's my love. And in my podcast, I want people to hear that. If you if you um, use my service as a patient advocate, you get to see it. But my part, the listeners don't see me, so they get to hear it. So my 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 faith journey is definitely important to me because I want people to feel that love. And I've noticed on your podcast, you don't really talk about patient advocacy. Why? What's the decision there? Because even mm-hmm. if it's just life. Mm-hmm. I'm advocating for you to advocate for your better life. I'm advocating that you see beyond where you are without telling you that I'm advocating for. Um, As you said earlier, podcasting is a huge umbrella. And although I do not call it uh, being a patient advocate, my podcast is just simply, it's patient advocacy. But it's just with a twist. And that twist is just, as I said earlier, being faith-based in love. Beautiful. I I got a note from one of our onboarding assistants before you kind of came on the podcast to ask you about the most dangerous and unforeseen adventure you had while on vacation. And I purposely didn't ask you before. I kind of wanted to to keep the surprise for myself. But if you wouldn't mind sharing, I'd love to hear the story. Sure. Um, my daughter was, well, our daughter was in the 12th grade. She was getting ready to graduate, and she made straight A's. So for that particular um, time, I said to her, we're going to go take a journey, a trip. We went on a cruise, and it was a seven-day cruise, beautiful. But I got hurt on the cruise. So I had on some little sandals, and we was going down to this little dome in the um, British Virgin Islands, and I slipped and twisted my ankles so bad. I didn't know it was hurt that bad, so I like to just sit there and just wait till everybody leave, and they had to pick me up and carry me back to the ship. People had their hands on me in places that I didn't want them to have their hands on me. I got ready to get on the boat to get back to the ship, the uh, little ferry boat to get back to the bigger the uh, cruise boat. They wouldn't let me on because I didn't pay for that one. People forced me on. It was, the guy was upset, threatening to call the police on me. But I get back to the uh, ship and I'm injured really badly. I, they want to leave me in the British Virgin Islands, I can go to the doctor, but I refused to go. And even in that, I was not a patient advocate then, wasn't even thinking about it. But I realized that that, that a defining moment in my life as well, because then and there in a different country, I had to advocate for my own health, make sure I get the health care that I needed without being left. So I was, I was pretty scared of my husband didn't know about, you know, we had health insurance, but he didn't understand what was going to happen. My daughter's in high school. It was, it was rough. It was, yeah. And I was in pain. How did you get the, the attention you needed? Did you just get it on the ship? I absolutely did. They were not leaving me in a country that I. (laughs) I mean, were there enough medical professionals to address it? Absolutely. So what happened, the reason they wanted to leave me was because the x-ray machine was broken. And they wanted to make sure that my foot or ankle wasn't broken. So I said to them, the next port that we went to, I would go and get my foot checked because I knew I would have enough time. So what I did was I called my family back in the United States and it was to call um, the Bahamas, Nassau Bahamas Hospital, and let them know what day I was coming so that I could have an appointment to go get my foot x-rayed 
so that I would not miss that uh, yacht, the crew was coming back. So when the ship docked, I went to the hospital, had my foot x-rayed, I was fine, and I went back and made it back on the ship. Good Thanks. for you. <laughs> I hope they gave you some oh, painkillers just to kind of enjoy the rest of the cruise. Yeah, you know? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, they, were you, were you crutches on a cruise sound a little complicated, but luckily they probably, they yeah. have elevators, so it's not so bad. Yeah. Um, where are you, where are you based out of and where do you actually work with people in person? And then what kind of services can you offer virtually? So I'm based in Star Mountain, Georgia. So it's right outside of Atlanta in between uh, Gwinnett County. So Gwinnett County is a huge county. And that's just huge. And then the, I live in the Camp County. So I'm in between three major uh, counties. So that's really considered the metropolitan area. Um, but the services that I offer are for families, but mostly for uh, older um, clients. I, I love helping geriatric clients um, because, again, that's where we can be dehumanized and, and not as cared for as we should. So that's, that's my specialty. Um, cancer, different types of cancers. Yes, you can contact me. I can do um, teleservices. And what I would do is just talk you through your hospital visit, go over your what you need. I could help you file an appeal if you need to. Um, just recently, I helped someone file an appeal that was in a nursing home. They wanted to release her. I got that appeal overturned. Um, I will go to the hospital with you. I will teach you your rights by showing you where you can find those privacy rights in the hospital, patient rights in the hospital where they are posted. I teach you how to ask for uh, risk management if need be. So whatever you move, more, pretty much I'm able to do. And if I cannot, that's the beauty of being a patient advocate. There are others that are more savvy and more knowledgeable in certain areas than I am, and I can connect them with those people. I always love hearing that. I mean, I think the advocacy space is so collaborative and knowing where your expertise ends instead of saying, oh, we'll figure it out. It's like, no, there's another person that I can call. We've already connected. I've worked with them on other cases. And that spirit of collaboration and connection, um, I really feel should be spread more in the medical field in general. So I'm glad to see it so alive and well in the advocacy space. Well, I think because we want to make sure that we impact the um, healthcare setting, it starts with us. So we eventually it will carry over into the uh, healthcare setting. I really believe that. Where, uh, so your podcast, See Beyond Where You Are, I assume people can check that out on the Apple Store, the iTunes Store, and Spotify anywhere, and all those places. Anywhere is that right? you can find a podcast, my podcast is there. And if people want to work with you directly as an advocate, what's the easiest way for them to get in touch with they you? They can email me directly at cbond, B-O-N-D, at cbeyondwhereyouare.com, spelled out. cbond at cbeyondwhereyouare.com. Absolutely. All right? Great. Kathy Bond, thank you so much for being here. I really do appreciate thank it. Thank you, John, so very much.